up, level up, level up, level up, level up, level up, level up. Five, four, three, two, one. Dr. Lowry, I accept your challenge to get involved with voter registration, education, and participation. Hey, Dr. Lowry, I accept your challenge to level up and get involved with voter engagement. Happy birthday, Dr. Lowry. On your day, I accept the challenge to level up and get involved with registration, participation, and education. Dr. Lowry, I accept your challenge to level up and get involved with voter engagement. Dr. Lowry, I accept your challenge to level up and get involved with the Voter Education and Registration Initiative. Hey, Dr. Lowry, I accept your challenge to level up and get involved with voter engagement. Dr. Lowry, I accept your challenge to level up and get involved with registration, education, and participation. What's up, Dr. Lowry? I will accept your challenge to get involved with voter engagement. Happy birthday, Dr. Lowry. On behalf of the Lowry Institute Change Agents, we accept your challenge to level up, and we have gotten involved with civic engagement, voter registration, education, and participation. As millennials, we will go out and vote on November 6th. We will continue to carry out the Lowry legacy by engaging the Atlanta University Center and the community surrounding us. Thank you for your service to mankind. Level up. Level up. Georgia is leveling up in voter registration, education, participation. Level up. Hope. Hello. Good morning. At this time, we ask everyone who is able to please join until the colors have been retired. Following the singing of our national anthem by Shania Robinson. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rock yards red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. 
Welcome to the Reverend Joseph E. Lowry Auditorium and the Dang Bink Lawton Thero High School, home of the Panthers and today's host of the Reverend Joseph E. Lowry Lecture Series on Civic Engagement. I am Denver Jackson, a senior here at Thero High School. I bring you greetings on behalf of Thero students, staff, community partners, our principal, Ms. Shelley Powell, and the entire administrative team. We hope you will enjoy and be inspired by this unique event, created 16 years ago to honor the life and legacy of Reverend Joseph E. Lowry, one of the nation's strongest and most consistent advocates for racial justice, human rights, and rural peace. We are delighted to have his daughter, Cheryl Lowry, with us today. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Cheryl Lowry and family. Again, everyone, welcome to Therrell, and thank you for your presence here today. At this time, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Sims, Associate Superintendent of High Schools for Atlanta Public Schools. He will bring us greetings, followed by remarks from Ms. Cheryl Lowry, the daughter of Reverend Lowry. Let's give Denver Jackson a round of applause. Great job. Fantastic job. On behalf of our superintendent, Dr. Maria Karstarfen, I'd like to bring greetings on behalf of the Atlanta Public School District and to welcome all of our wonderful uh, guests to this wonderful occasion. And uh, students, I don't want to call you students in my greetings. I want to call you reasons. Because at the end of the day, you are the reasons that we take the time to put these kinds of events together. Today, you are the reasons that we take the time to honor a great man, not just an Atlanta legend, not just a national legend, but in my eyes, a worldwide legend. You're the reasons that somebody like him continues to be somebody who's so widely respected. And I vividly recall at your age, at the age of 17, and actually Karen Lowry was my uh, choir director for the coming generation choir at Cascade United Methodist Church. And she's here this morning as well. But I recall listening to this man preach. I recall sitting next to him on a bus when we took a trip to Selma for the commemoration of the march across Edmund Pettus Bridge. And it's crazy to me that that was 30 years ago. And at that time, I considered him, considered him to be an elderly man. And for him to still be in the game, and to still be relevant, and to still be fighting, and for his name to still make sense to people when it's mentioned, it blows my mind. But just know you're the reason we're here today. You're the reason that we take any time to do anything outside of the classroom to enrich your life. So I want to thank you in advance for your attention to this time frame. Uh, for your indulgence in this time frame. I want to thank everyone who's come to be a part of this, our debaters, looking forward to a rich discussion. And somebody is going to walk out of this auditorium this morning better informed and confounded about your own life because now you're going to figure out there's something else that you need to do because you've been blessed to do what you've done so far. So it's in that vein that I greet you this morning. And I believe at this time we're going to have a brief video and then we'll bring our dear, my dear friend, Cheryl Lowry, to the auditorium or to the uh, podium for further remarks. The video will play at this time. As wise as humans are, we're stupid in terms of how we choose to settle our differences. And any contribution I can make to helping people stand up and be counted for nonviolence. I want to do it. I want to have people say he was against violence. We believe we ought to turn to each other and not on each other. But you would tell them to not hit somebody back if yes. they were to be hit? Yes, what we're saying is that we, we are never going to advocate 
a violent response. Right. We just, we're not going to do that. Right. So yes. one of our challenges is figuring out alternative responses when you do have a physical altercation, when you are attacked. We wanted to give students an opportunity to really learn about the advocacy and work of Joseph and Evelyn Lowry and create change agents in their own rights. And so we decided to do it on three tiers. First, we trained them in peer mediation and dispute resolution. Um, and then they spend four days a week in elementary schools, a middle school, and now an alternative school. It's pretty simple. Stop, think, engage, process, and just start over. And we picked a certain group in the school, and the change agents, these young people from the colleges working with the Institute, they seized that opportunity to help those kids at Parkinson find a new way. Um, we're hoping to engage with a number, I, almost 200 students this year, elementary school students, um, to engage them on these nonviolent practices. So how can we change some of their life outcomes? How can we change um, some of their futures to go be in college, be at our wonderful HBCUs when they get to 18 and 20 years old? Um, so that's what we're hoping to do this year um, and really have a lasting legacy in their lives. And the principal, at the end of the year, told us that there had been considerable improvement in the behavior patterns of the children that the change agents work with. And I said, glory, hallelujah. Um, the second thing that the change agents do is they go through a servant leadership program. We have eight sessions throughout the year and we're trying to give them the tools that they need to make good choices in their lives to be servant leaders. And the third thing, Joseph and Evelyn Lowry um, weren't just think tanks, they were activists. And so the third thing they do is either they find their own voice and we support them in their own student-led movement, or they support us with something that we're doing. I expected to just go to some schools and mentor some kids, but I'm getting opportunities from judges, getting opportunities to meet Dr. Lowry and the likes of him, and I feel like that will open doors for me and people that look like me, and I'll be able to go out into the community and to actually make an impact on a macro level. I thought I was just gonna be doing micro work, but it's bigger than what I expected. It's transformed my life, and it's given me the opportunity to really transform the lives of other students as well. I think people have the capacity for good. If we can find that key that unlocks interests, enthusiasm, happiness, joy, determination, if we can find the key to unlock those factors in our lives, we're on our way but to turn to each other and not on each other. Let us welcome to the stage the CEO and president of the Joseph and Evelyn Lowry Institute for Justice and Human Rights, and one of the beautiful daughters of this great man, Cheryl Lowry. Thank you so much for your attendance today at the Lowry Lecture Series. While my father was unable to be with us today, my sister Karen, as you've heard, is here today. Karen, if you please stand. I'm also joined by Lowry Institute board member Gwen Campbell. If you'd stand, Gwen. And two of the gladiators on the Lowry Institute team, Blanche Payne and, J and John Brogdon. A little short, huh? Okay, thank you. Again, this is the 16th year of the Lowry Lecture Series. We're certainly grateful to the Atlanta Public School System for continuing this program, to your illustrious principal. Thank you for having us in this Lowry um, auditorium. Um, one thing you have to know about Lowry's is we cry a lot. Um, so, uh, to excuse that. But it's just what we do. We're very emotional people. <laughs> so thank you, we're very appreciative of this um, opportunity to be here today. Students, we've had some incredible speakers over these 16 years talking to you about how you ought to be engaged in issues that affect you as citizens of the United States, about your responsibility to vote and be engaged in laws that govern how you move through this world. Instead of a lecture this year, we've opted again to utilize the art of debate 
to challenge you to think through different sides of an issue. Thanks to Ken Newby and the Morehouse debate team for joining us again this year. And we welcome the Jamaican Association for Debating and Empowerment, an international debate team located in Jamaica for joining us this year as well. So welcome to you guys. As you saw in that video at the Lowry Institute, we mentor 77 college students on servant leadership, which we're so grateful that Dr. Sims has been and taught with those students. Uh, we talk, many of them teach in nonviolent curriculum and conflict resolution in the Atlanta public schools. The thought is, we're going to disagree, but disagreeing with someone does not have to lead to violence and disrespect. So debating is an incredible way to respect the thoughts of one while freely and respectfully sharing an opposing view. How many of you plan on staying in Atlanta and attending college here next year? Anybody? We invite you to come and become a change agent at the Lowry Institute. We're located on the uh, campus of Clark Atlanta University. <laughs> As I close, as you know, Dr. Lowry turned 97 um, last year, and the video you saw at the beginning was a level up challenge that he gave to our change agents. He had one wish with three parts. One is that we register to vote. Two is that we educate ourselves about the election. And three is that we actually go to the poll and vote. How many of you seniors in here registered to vote? Awesome. You know you can start voting today. Early voting has already begun. And if you still can't vote, someone you love can. Please let this day, with focus on civic participation, motivate you to make your voice heard and encourage everyone around you to start voting today. Level up and vote. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lowry, for providing insights and for continuing the legacy through the Joseph and Evan Lowry Institute for Justice and Human Rights. My name is Jasmine Smith, and I am also a senior here at Thera High School. <laughs> through the video you just watched, I hope you have a better sense of Reverend Lowry's life of advocacy that has spanned more than a half century. Just to be sure, I am going to share a few highlights from his life and legacy. In 1957, Reverend Lowry joined with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other Southern ministers to organize the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Reverend Lowry served as vice president until 1967, then chairman of the board until February 1977, and as president and CEO until January 1998. On January 20th, 2009, Reverend Lowry delivered the benediction for the inauguration of President Barack Obama as the 44th President of the United States. In August 2009, President Obama awarded Reverend Lowry the nation's highest civilian award, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. On Reverend Lowry's 80th birthday on October 6, 2001, the city of Atlanta changed the name of Ashby Street to Joseph E. Lowry Boulevard. Clark Atlanta University founded the Joseph E. Lowry Institute for Justice and Human Rights, and Atlanta Public Schools established the Reverend Joseph E. Lowry Lecture Series on Civic Engagement. Reverend Lowry's legacy of civil rights, social justice, and human rights will continue to have a long-lasting impact on the students of Atlanta Public Schools through this lecture series, which we all have the privilege of attending today. Over the years, this series has featured prominent keynote speakers, including Martin Luther King III and Georgia gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams. In 2016, the lecture series changed its format from having a keynote speaker to featuring area college debate teams. Today we will continue in debate format with teams from Jamaica and Atlanta. I welcome both teams to the stage. <laughs> to help facilitate the debates, I also welcome Thera High School debate team coach, Ms. Banks.
Thank you, Jasmine. What you are about to witness is a debate between two talented and successful teams, the Morehouse College Speech and Debate Team and the Jamaican Association for Debating and Empowerment Limited, or JADE for short. The JADE team includes Patrice Mento from the University of Technology and Akeem Clark from the University of West Indies. Patrice has spoken at the last three editions of the World University's Debating Championships, or WUDC, and is currently the tertiary level national debate champion. Akeem, a high school national debate champion in 2017, entered collegiate debating last year and broke in a record number. The Jade contingent is completed by coaches Jermaine Barrett, who serves as a president of Jade, and Javon Henry, who is the special projects coordinator. Both are WUDC breaking judges with vast experience in debate administration. Let's give Jade a round of applause. The Morehouse team includes Daniel Edwards and Hatim Mansouri. The Morehouse debate program is currently directed by attorney and professor Kenneth A. Newby. Under his leadership, the team has earned more than four international titles, including having won the Pan American University's debating championship three times, seven national titles, including having won the Pi Kappa Delta National Championship in parliamentary debate four times, and hundreds of additional awards, making Morehouse debate one of the best teams in the world and the only HBCU to compete in the World University's Debating Championship. Let's, get, let's give a round of applause for Morehouse. <laughs> Teams will deliver four constructive speeches after which APS students will be allotted 10 minutes to come to the microphone in the center aisle and pose a question to a team, specific team member, or to make general comments. After the audience participation period concludes, the teams will have four minutes each to make their closing arguments. Let's get started. Here is our resolution. This house believes that kneeling is a legitimate form of protest against police brutality. Morehouse will be arguing the affirmative and Jade will be arguing the negative. Our first debater will be from Morehouse. Please approach the center. Check. There we go. You have seven minutes. Yes, ma'am. Please begin. Before I begin, I would like to uh, give a blanket of thank yous to everyone that's come here. Thank you so much for this opportunity, the Joseph E. Lowry Foundation. I'd like to thank the J team for uh, debating against us and having a proper case. And I'd like to thank the school for uh, hosting us for this debate. And of course, my partner, Daniel Edwards, for being a great partner, and my coach for giving me this opportunity. I appreciate you. Now to begin. Change cannot be made in the dark. Change can only be made in the light of day. The brightest light of day is right on your TV screens with 17 million viewers watching the, the National Football League, a sports league whose player base is 76% African American. Defining legitimate, the resolution states, this house believes that kneeling is a legitimate form of protest against police brutality. Before we can get into today's debate, we must first understand what does legitimate mean. We cannot go by the dictionary definition of legitimate, which is basically follow the rules. So society even often automatically deems 
protests as illegitimate by calling them riots. So for the sake of this debate, we will define legitimate as just and effective. A, a protest aim is to, at very least, bring more awareness. The reason for protest. Before I can go into whether or not kneeling is just and effective, we have to first know why people are kneeling in the first place. Unfortunately, institutional racism is an integral part of our social justice system. We have police brutality where it sanctions, it sanctions unlawful killings of innocent black people, such as Michael Brown Jr., Oscar Grant, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, who was just following orders of the police officer. And what do these police officers who kill these innocent people get? A slap on the wrist, oftentimes paid leave, or might as well just call it paid vacation. We also have institutionally racist practices such as stop and frisk and racial profiling, which gives police officers the right to stop any black person they see and give them permission to violate their human rights. Black people do not feel safe when they are around people who are supposed to protect and serve them the most. The importance of protest. If we don't protest, we literally die. Imagine our community as a patient and the society as a doctor. If you get an infection, which in this case, it is racism that plagues our community, what do you do? You tell the doctor. Sure, if it's not that dire, you make an appointment. In this case, you go to your local congressperson and wait in line to talk to them. But if you have people dying out here in the streets, you go straight to the emergency room, which in this case would be go straight outside, go protest, go march, and you have to, make, you have to disrupt the, uh, norm, the norm of society. People should voice their opinion whenever and wherever, not just where it's most convenient. Does a player have the right to protest? The short answer, yes, just like any other worker. We, when you look at whether or not somebody has the right to do something, you have to first consider, is it in the boundaries of the Constitution and whether or not it is harmful towards others? It is completely within the boundaries of the Constitution to protest at your workplace against your workplace. And kneeling does not bring any physical harm to anybody, therefore it is morally sound. It is, but it, is also doesn't, it also does not mean that NFL players are free from consequence, right? The NFL is still a private business and they can fine and fire whoever they please. But people, but the NFL players know this and are willing to make the sacrifice because they know that a few thousand measly dollars is worth the price to fight for a cause that is bigger than themselves. Play, um, the NFL is also smart and they will not fire these players because they need them to play in their league in order to be a competitive sports league. Also, the NFL player is a full-time job. To advocate for the removal of one of the most effective and only ways for these NFL players to voice their opinion is also to advocate for censorship and injustice. We should always prioritize black advocacy over the profit of white NFL owners. Change spurs from disruption. Opposers of the kneeling argue that disrespect, uh, argue that the kneeling is disrespectful towards veterans and the flag and is unpatriotic, right? But what actually disrespects veterans and flag? Before, kneel, before Kaepernick started kneeling, what did he do? He actually sat down during the, uh, during the anthem. But after, after cons consulting with the veteran, he started to kneel. Veterans also fight for the rights when they went out to war for America's rights, and which included the right to protest. So these opposers are actually undermining the veterans' strife for freedom, and that is the real disrespect. According to Section 8 of the United States Flag Code, it is actually very disrespectful to wear the United States flag anywhere on your body. You can't even let the United States flag touch the floor, and you can have people um, uh, celebrating Fourth of July with flag, flag towels and everything, and they are actually very hypocritical when they say that people, uh, Kaepernick is disrespecting the flag when, in fact, uh, he is the one, when they're disrespecting the flag. Why is this important? Because, yes. We don't have to explain to you why kneeling is more legitimate than anything else. We have to explain to you why kneeling is a legitimate form of protest, not that it is the most. Why is it important that we, uh, because we, why is it important to, for me to say these things? We want things to change in this country. We want people to do something about the injustice in this country. This can't happen if people are comfortable. 
we have to get people out of their seats and raise their hairs, which kneeling at the NFL brings disruption straight to the 17 million viewers at, um, and force a necessary conversation to be had. No significant change can, has ever come from one source of protest, but we would still say that kneeling is a part of change. Kneeling has made a significant impact. Kneeling leads to real life change. Actual change occurs out of a conversation. First, you must have a uh, conversation before, kneel, uh, before change can ever come. The conversation around kneeling in the NFL is that conversation. A recent example would be that Laquan McDonald tape in Chicago. Kneeling, the kneeling protest actually pressured society to have the tape released. McDonald was shot 16 times in the back, with, uh, unprovoked, and they were hiding the dash cam camera footage that proved this. When it was released, the mayor pledged not to run for re-election and the police commissioner was fired. Immediately, Chicago Police Department issued de-escalation training and tasers to the police officers. No, it's not the end of racism and police brutality in Chicago, but it's still a lot better than what was. And the, the important thing is that we allow people to, pro, uh, to protest and voice their opinions any which way they, they, seem fit, they seem fit. Even at worst, that kneeling doesn't achieve change, we still believe it's important to have your voice heard without censorship. The NFL and opposers saying protest should only happen in a certain place and certain time um, is a dangerous president. If we allow that to happen, it literally proves the NFL commissioners own their black player base as they degrade their bodies on the field of, for the entertainment, basically flaunting their position as slave master and a player as a slave. That we can't talk back to massa and do as they're told. For all these reasons, we are very proud to affirm the resolution. Thank you, Morehouse. Jade, you have eight minutes to counter. So before I begin, I would like to start by giving you a Jamaican greeting. Well go on, everybody. <laughs> In Jamaica, that means what's up. All right. So uh, I would actually want to thank you guys for coming out. I want to thank the Lori Institute for keeping this event. I want to thank the Atlanta Public Schools for keeping this event and coming out in their numbers, right? We hope that we will definitely be putting on an amazing debate for you guys today. And uh, we want to thank the Moore Host team for actually agreeing to debate with us. All right, so uh, I will actually begin now. So the ideas that were brought up by the Moore Host debate team, we actually want to reject a lot of the ideas that they brought forward. Simply because we are not rejecting the idea of protesting. We're not arguing what the re we're not arguing to find out the reasons behind why protests in and of itself are legitimate, right? We are arguing particularly why kneeling is a very important or legitimate form of protest. And so we are rejecting the idea that they're trying to, to create this inclusive environment, like uh, uh, with this inclusive environment with kneeling and other forms of protest. We're singling out kneeling. So what we're saying on our side of the house is that we believe that kneeling is in and of itself, not protests, is a legitimate form of protesting, right? Not other forms of protesting. And they are mentioning uh, various ideas on their side of the house that makes it seem as if if you don't protest, right, you will die. And we agree that you will probably die if it is that we don't protest. But we're saying particularly kneeling does not pre present the utility that is necessary in, in, in our space today. And I'll be explaining why. My entire speech is a rebuttal. All right. So we understand that black people are being killed unfairly. We understand that the, that the truth is that black lives matter. The truth is that we agree that it is imperative to support the best mechanisms to protect black lives. The disagreement that we have is, is what mechanism is considered as the best option. Frankly, we believe that we should consider the most legitimate mechanism to fight for the most fundamental right, and that is the right to life, because everything is at stake here. We believe that something to be considered as legitimate, its aim and its principles must be considered as justifiable. If the problem we set out to solve is not solved or worsened by the action, then the legitimacy of the action in and of itself is undermined. 
We do not believe that kneeling is a legitimate form of protest. We believe that for something to be legitimate, its message must be explicit, must be free from potential dilution or pollution, and it must have a positive impact. So let's explore the reasons why we question the legitimacy of the idea of kneeling in and of itself. How many of us actually feel uh, how many of us actually feel more compelled to do something for a group of people or persons that have attacked or disrespected something that we hold dear to us? How many of us actually feel less obligated to have any form of ties to these parties? Well, most of us actually do. Most people react to negative stimuli not with open arms but with resistance. The flag of any country is seen as sacred. This is true too in the United States. In the US, the flag acts as a symbol of appreciation, of celebration, and of recollection. Recollection in solidarity. It is a reminder for, of the fight for freedom, of every black death of every black man who died beside his white brother for the fight for liberty. It is a reminder to all the families that has witnessed or heard of the deaths of their fathers, their brothers, their mothers, their aunts, their uncles of every creed, every color and every single generation that what we that we actually still hold their sacrifices in high regard and that we will never forget their contributions in the 1900s about 25 percent of the army was made up of minority groups the largest population of which were black people right and the thing is it has increased since 2004 up to 2015 where we have seen where this percentage has gone up to 40 percent and a large percentage of these individuals are actually african-americans based on these statistics we can clearly see that my, the minority contribution is even more significant. We believe, therefore, that to desecrate the flag means disrespecting, disrespecting the very people you are advocating for and their very sacrifices. How unfortunate is it that we find disrespecting every move that allowed the country to formally establish itself, the fight for everything that is now accessible and enjoyed in the country, everything that is dear to America, the freedom, the diversity, and the comfort as something that is okay. Aiming to disrespect the flag, in our opinion, it does no good. It slaps the persons who made the sacrifices, who afforded us our freedoms in their face. It stirs up negative emotions for anyone who feels patriotic to the flag or the flag represents, and it in turn only stirs up resistance not cooperation because of how dearly these things are held. There's an example of a video that actually exists on YouTube where this young man decided to kneel in front of the flag. What we saw happening was that a coach ran over to this young man, picked him up in the middle of the playing of the national anthem and the raising of the flag. The crowd they erupted. People in the crowd were like, hell yes, yes, get him up. You know the, 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 the description of the video was on YouTube? What a way to stand up for your country. This shows the resistance and the, the, the aggression that surrounds the idea of kneeling before the flag and we want to reject something like this. It will get attention from people, yes, but what kind of attention? The type that does not get politicians to change bills and laws because they oftentimes are expected to stand up against the desecration of anything symbolic. When anyone go, chooses to ignore protocols, it instead creates a safe haven for them to don't play on the character of anyone who participates because they feel that they have the right to side with patriotic Americans. Politicians end up questioning the legitimacy of the action itself and not necessarily the idea behind it. The action not only stirs up resistance, but it also takes the attention from the reason it was done uh, because of the nature of the stance in and of itself. Right? Most tabloids, they glorified conversations surrounding the idea of kneeling before the flag. The country got instantly divided with the action taken by the members of the NFL. People formed opinions about whether or not the action taken was fair to Americans, whether or not the action taken should be promoted, right? Or whether or not the NFL has the responsibility in ensuring that it never happens again. The emphasis is placed on those who participated and whose careers it might affect. The most popular arguments sacrificed surface in the internet surrounded Donald's tr Donald Trump's talk about firing. It's including the talk of people burning their Nike apparatus, right? Because they look on the ringleader of the action. Not, not because, sorry, they look on the ringleader of the action. The talk was another that Nike chose to start take on a person who stood up against police brutality widely. Nor was it that Trump wanted to fire a man who stood up for black lives widely. But the idea that he wanted to fire men who disrespected the United States and whether or not kneeling was bad or good. The media companies like CNN and Fox News and New York Times and even the economics, e economists indirectly causes the overshadowing of the idea that this was a protest about the eradication of innocent black lives. The whole, not accepted, 
The whole idea of standing up for police brutality is desecrated by the media because of what the action in and of itself represents. Therefore, the seriousness is undermined and overlooked because the emphasis is placed elsewhere. What adds to the elevation of this problem is the fact that society has a visceral response. The problem matters more than the actual American because of how dearly they hold their uh, to the actual American because of how dearly they hold their opinions. It gets more time in the media because of the attention of the media and the loud voices, the aggression, the intolerance that gets the real message lost in the noise. Another issue is that we find instead of listening to the players about the issues surrounding systemic racism, it's been wrapped into the military and the flag and creating an even greater complexity of problems. Let's tell you what uh, forces change. LeBron James's family foundation pays for hundreds of children to enter Cedar Point Amusement Park. He gets various celebrities to perform and he incorporated in the year that I was there the whole idea of Black Lives Matter. He tried to empower as many black children about their rights. Tell them how valuable they were to society. It was open to whites, Asians, everybody in the park and as a result of that people were empowered and understood the matter. We believe that things like these, reenacting the Martin Luther King days, forcing the government to actually consider these things are more legitimate forms of protest and I want to thank you. Thank you, Jade. Morehouse, you have eight minutes for your second constructive speech. Just again, before we get started, oh. I'm not gonna mess with the mic, um, I know better. But thank you all for coming out. Thank the Lowry Foundation, thank my coach. Um, and just, just thank everyone for coming out. I'm glad that we can have a debate today that can really allow us to challenge the different viewpoints that we have in today's society. And with that, I'm gonna get right into the debate. In terms of how my opponent frames the debate today, you see that there's a lot of muddling in terms of what constitutes a legitimate form of protest. They believe that anything that causes some form of backlash or causes white people or oppressive individuals within an environment to become somehow uncomfortable or allows people to question the profit relationship that exploits black men in today's society is somehow not a legitimate form of protest. Keep in mind, according to their definition, they say that anything that causes individuals to have negative feelings towards the individuals who are crying out for help because they have no recourse is not going to be a legitimate form of protest. So that means that the Atlanta student movement that happens right up the street from here wasn't a legitimate protest because it made white individuals at the time uncomfortable. The protest that we saw, Martin Luther King Lee, the Montgomery bus boycott, well, that put white people's economic um, futures in jeopardy and that put their money in jeopardy in terms of the bus um, and its contribution to the economy. That made white individuals and oppressive individuals uncomfortable. That's not a legitimate form of protest. We can't buy into this idea that somehow by making individuals uncomfortable, we are somehow delegitimizing a protest movement. Protests are designed to make people uncomfortable because insofar as certain individuals, specifically people of color in today's society, have absolutely no other recourse, we have to understand that protest is the only way in which we can exert our rights and actually bring attention to the place that we face. Because if you go down the street, and I'm sure that a lot of the individuals in this class here, in this auditorium here today, have had the talk from their parents about what to do when you get pulled over, about where to have your hands, about how to have your ID readily presentable and not provoke police officers. Because we understand that the government that these, they say the flag represents and should be a solemn symbol does not apply to us and does not represent us. Uh, my opponent said that the flag is sacred. The flag that we see today is the same iteration of the flag that saw us brought to this country, losing our history, losing our heritage to the system of shadow slavery and the triangular trade system. It's the same flag that flew over Union battlefields when this country had to exert actual military force upon another separate um, part of this country to make sure that they could even afford the most basic human rights to citizens that only counted as three-fifths of a human being before that war. It's the same flag that flew I'll take your point of information now. All right, thank you very much. And we are not looking for people. We believe that protest is something that already exists. And even without any sudden 
Anytime you bring attention to problems that you face within civil society, that is successful protest. That is legitimate protest. They bring up other examples talking about the fact, well, there are quieter and more diplomatic methods for us to go about asserting our rights as people of color in today's society. And they brought up a very credible example, LeBron James's school initiative in Ohio. However, the same skewed narrative that you see from Fox News pundits and conservative icons like Ann Coulter, where they say that, well, LeBron James isn't paying for the totality of the student's education, so clearly this is some sort of socialist scheme, right? The same arguments that you see there are also applied to this movement, which only furthers our point that by making individuals uncomfortable, by calling into question these oppressive relationships, that is an inherently legitimate form of protest. And that's what we, we really need to emphasize in today's debate, because we should not take away the legitimacy of a protest or take away the free speech of individuals in today's society at the cost of making individuals comfortable. Because at that point, you delegitimize future protests far into the future and anytime an individual wants to speak up, if an individual can somehow claim that they are harmed or made uncomfortable, then you have a situation where you can delegitimize not only their right to protest, but also their right to the First Amendment and freedom of speech that that affords them, which leaves you a whole slippery slope of how demagogues like Donald Trump can call for the censorship of these individuals like Colin Kaepernick when he kneels because we understand that when you make these individuals uncomfortable, you're going to have a situation where individuals skew the narrative to try and make it seem negative. Just to get in terms of more uh, reputation on it, what they said, they said that, well, Donald Trump is making statements, wide, widespread statements on Colin Kaepernick's taking a knee movement and this legitimate form of protest. However, we understand that the exact same reason why the, the flag is not sacred to people of color in today's society and the same reason why you can attack Colin Kaepernick as being so-called not patriotic is because of the fact that you have to ask the question. In a society where you understand that you're not represented and only a few people who look like you have even a remote seat at the table at the cost of large scale oppression that you feel day in and day out, you have to wonder, why do I stand for this flag? Why do I stand for this anthem? Because it's never represented me in the first place. I am a descendant of an individual who counted as only three-fifths of a human in this country. And I understand that the same flag that flew over this country then flies over this country now. And as a direct result of that, I cannot be overtly patriotic because I have no idea of what this country represents for me. So in terms of that protest movement being a so-called unpatriotic act, the obligation is on this nation to truly represent each and every citizen, no matter their creed, color, skin tone, whatever. It's on them, it's their obligation. And then when they finally do that, we can actually have a situation where we can be overtly patriotic. We can stand for the anthem because we know that the land of the free and the home of the brave is our home as well. Now let's just get into the fact that, oh, oh, the facts concerning why protest is so essential. I'm just gonna extend the points that my partner made. And so in terms of why protest is important, you have to understand, first of all, we are causing a situation in which we are disrupting the status quo, right? We have to understand that disruption of the status quo for individuals in today's society that don't have a seat at the table, that have no other recourse, is an outcry. The same outcry that we saw in the 60s during the Civil Rights Movement, the raw, powerful outcry of the actual, real human emotion and pain that we face every day just because of our inherent experience. And as a result, given the fact that we have no institutional recourse, given the fact that we see racial profiling and police getting off scot-free when they murder individuals uh, who have black and brown skin, just like me and my partner and the other debaters in here today, we understand that this is the only method in which we can actually assert rights for ourselves. Furthermore, we understand that legally we have the right to do so. So when demagogues like Donald Trump say that, oh, this is unpatriotic, well, we can only point them to Pickering versus the Board of Education, a Supreme Court case that allowed an individual to protest his employer and to protest the place where he was working. And the Supreme Court erred on the side of First Amendment privileges because they understand that insofar as you have oppressed minorities in this country, you're always going to have a situation where free speech is the only thing that they can fall back on. And that's why this is a legitimate movement. And finally, the fact that this manifests in real life change. My partner brought the example of Laquan McDonald where these protests and the environment created around them created societal pressures on people within systems of government, specifically 
in the city of Chicago that allowed them to actually have a situation to where they could advocate for themselves in a government where they saw no large scale representation and they were able to hold individuals accountable who represented them and tried to shirk their responsibilities to representative government for the sake of political expediency. So this means that insofar as not only is it legally legitimate, not only is it effective, not only is it a situation where if you count their definition, none of the civil rights have been legitimate in the first place because God forbid we make people uncomfortable in today's society. We have to understand that this is the most legitimate form of outcry that people of color have in today's society. And that's why you have to vote for the presidency. Thank you. Thank you, Morehouse. Jade, you have the final eight minutes. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Let me first thank the Lori Institute. I also want to thank the Atlanta Public Schools, Morehouse College, for being here with us today. God will find a solution for this revolution, yeah. Let me just say this and make it really clear because I think there is a, misunder a misunderstanding on side government. We are not against protest, but we believe that if you protest, if you kneel, then it should be solution oriented. Because the Prime Minister said to us that kneeling does not bring any form of results. So what's the form of kneel? What's the sense in kneeling? Now, let me say, start by saying that darkness cannot drive out darkness. That is madness. Standing for the national anthem is no way of sugarcoating realities of racism and police brutality in this country. But the truth is that whilst the intention may, may be clear, there's no measurable solution and that is the problem. Original civil rights, uh, civil rights leaders such as Reverend Lowry Martin Luther, and Martin Luther King did not kneel to the flag or the national anthem. However, what they do was have peaceful, intentional and respectful protests and we saw tremendous changes in law. We saw the removal of what was known as the Jim Crow laws. What are the, the measurable solutions? Rather, what are the measurable success when you kneel? The PM said that kneeling does not come with any form of change. But I say unto you that the only thing I see kneeling comes with is a multi-million dollar deal with Nike. So I say unto you, do not kneel because you won't get that deal. Every single day in this country, there are men and women all around the world that are risking their life to create a more perfect union. But what an oxymoron it is that you kneel before the symbol that embodies your freedom of expression. Disrespecting the flag and national anthem is perceived as gross disrespect to America and all that she stands for. What this does, it inflames a deeper racial tension rather than moving towards unity. The flag and national anthem brings unity. This does not lead to solution, it is rather counterproductive. It leads to greater tension amongst races on three levels, and I'm going to show you how. One, it creates fractions in the black community because those who do not kneel, they are simply chastised and labeled as being complicit. The kneelers choose to label other black people who choose not to kneel as condoning police brutality and, and are therefore part of the enemy to be opposed. Secondly, it has an effect on the allies, persons who may not be of the race but sympathize with the struggle, but at the same time don't fully understand the struggle. These allies may not fully understand the struggles of the black race, but their limited appreciation leads them to sympathize. These are people who would be willing to listen and have conversation, engage in healthy conversation, but yet amid the noise and confusion caused by kneelers, these would-be allies are factored into three groups. Those who ally themselves with the enemy, those who choose to remain silent, and those who choose to uh, join the black, the black cause. Thirdly, those who are against the black community because they feel blacks have no right to speak out and that black people do not belong here will only become empowered when you kneel. Because after all, you kneel before the flag, you kneel before the, the, the anthem, which represents America. And disrespecting those symbols is 
is disrespecting the country. Another group of students that is adversely affected are students. These athletes are role models for so many young athletes and students. Now what we're seeing is no solution. We're only seeing a bigger problem because what you're seeing is students kneeling. We see a girls soccer team in Maine, in Maine a football team in Memphis, Tennessee, a football team and cheerleader in New York, a hundred students in California high school. Children are now caught in a crossfire of values and beliefs, becoming victim of verbal abuse and thrown aside. How is, that, how is it? that such a divisive measure is now being taken into school. An environment that gives students the opportunity and platform to speak out and have healthy conversation. To take a divisive measures in school is one of the worst things because what happens is that students are now being suspended, losing scholarships and even being kicked out. Kneeling simply is so kneeling, but it is not solution oriented. And that is what the opposition is trying to say. We do not oppose protests, but this protest should be legitimate and this protest should be solution oriented. And what of most noted instance where kneeling took place? A football match. It corrupts the usual fun and patriotic atmosphere before the game, right? You may have a number, you may have few right audience, and you also, sorry, you may have few right audience, but you are targeting the wrong place. The message simple becomes diluted. A football match is one of the few places that unite people. It nullifies their, their attitude. All races can be united with the only thing divided races is the, is the team you actually support. Bringing political and social division in one of the few spaces that unite people only serve to ruin the sport for everyone. What people are paying for at a football game is entertainment, an expectation that athletes should behave professional. Hence, athletes should behave in accordance to rules set out by their employer. And if such action must take, must take place, consent must be given. This simple violates the employer and employee uh, contract. Now, imagine. Imagine a news anchor, while he or she should be performing their job, which is reading in the news, choose to listen to some ro loud reggae music while smoking some marijuana in here. Would this be acceptable or legitimate? I think not. To many, the national anthem is not just a song. No, it is not. It represents the ultimate good in America. When people care about something as much as they do about the national anthem, disrespecting it will not promote an healthy dialogue. It is going to provoke anger. It is going to divide us. It is going to pull us apart. And that is what we don't want. Do not disrespect the symbol that brings us together. Now, the now notorious football player who now has the multi-million dollar deal with Nike. Protest, and what, what you must realize is that the protest, after the protest, the issues the issues that he was protesting for was not being focused on. So instead, the debate continues to focus on his method and his uh, patriotism, among a, among a slew of other aspects, such as his credibility, his right to protest, and the implication on the NFL future. After this kneeling, we never saw anything about the black race. It, the, 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 the focus shifted from the black race, which he initially protested for, to what now the mili to those who serve in the military, whether he is patriotic or, or, whether, or whether or not he should have nailed um, at a football match. A good portion of these focus on players, coaches who were in the military or have family in the military, constantly presenting the protest of it as if it was directed against the military, the flag and anthem. I say unto you that these forms of protests are not illegit illegit uh, illegit legitimate, rather. These forms of protests, they are not result-oriented. And if we're going to protest, if we want to see changes, kneeling does not bring changes. What kneeling brings, it brings is multi-million dollar deal for football players. What kneeling brings is, is a greater division amongst black people and a a uh, greater division for those who sympathize with black people and even push you further apart for those who are against black people. But I say unto you, my black brothers and sisters, heed the warning that if you are... Heed the warning. There's an African proverb that simply say that if you go alone, you go faster. But if you go together, 
you go further. And it is important for us to go together because That's united time. we stand, divided we shall fall. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Morehouse. We'll now open up the floor for questions from students in the audience. Students, when you approach the microphone, please state your name, school, and your grade level. Uh, okay. Good, good morning, everyone. My name is Antonia Williams. I am a senior here at DM Thera High School. Um, I basically have a statement or comment. Um, so, what he said, he said kneeling isn't um, solution oriented. You're right about that. But I think the, um, the bigger thing, the solution is, is when people are tired, like of being tired, that's when, that's, that's when the solution will come into place. So kneeling is not a solution oriented type of thing, but it is a strategy, it's like a domino effect. The more people do it, the more others will, um, you know, like gather on to that wave. So I think it's not like, a solution won't come into place until people are really tired of being tired. So that's, that's what I think. So, yeah, that's all I have. Hello, my name is Talisha Devine Guy. I'm from, I'm 11th grader at Curtis Scott King Young Women's Leadership Academy. And so my question is for this team over here. So you talk about having a respectful protest, but someone will always have conflicting viewpoints from what you're trying to argue. So, but my question, so, and. And we'll, and we'll come up with an excuse to illegitimize your, your cause. So my question is, how do you make your political oppressors legitimize our cause when we're, not, we're misrepresented in government? Right. So even though we're underrepresented in government, other forms of protest uh, basically don't attack individuals that do not need to be cross caught in a cross crossfire, but it's instead it brings the problems directly to Congress. It, 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 it product disrupts pro productivity. It, it gives the government an ultimatum before thousands of people, right? And thousands of people oftentimes participate in these processes. So these numbers are actually even great as well. So the government now has a responsibility, even in front of the millions of people that watch, to give the individuals a response. And given that their numbers are so large in quantity, what happens is that we see that it is harder for the government to disregard so many people having the stance in a moment to fight for something that it is that they believe. So yes, it might take a little while. Yes, we're underrepresented in conference, in, in Congress and so forth, but I believe that in numbers, in, in force, and giving the government a public ultimatum, uh, explicitly forces them to give us a better response than any other form of protest. Uh, thank you, but how long can we wait? My name is Naya Evans, and I am, a, I, am, I am a junior at Washington High School. My question for Jay Limited is, do you think that money is worth standing for the flat that saw us as property? Can you repeat your do, question? Do you think that money is worth standing for a flag that saw black people as property? So, in their argument, they said that we should be united by a flag or that kneeling will not get you a Nike. Well, you said that kneeling will not get you the money for a contract that the white investors give black people. Like they will not, um, how can I put this? Okay, that when kneeling, it could like, stop the process of 
football players from getting a contract or getting signed, right? So do you think that kneeling is worth more than standing up for black people? All right, so let me just, maybe you misinterpreted what I said earlier. Um, but at the end of the day, um, when Colin Neal, he was truly the only person that benefit. Because the truth about kneeling is that you've realized that at kneeling at the football match, what happens after that was persons talking about those who were in the military, uh, patriotism and all of that. So the focus, the, the, the initial reason why, why, why Colin kneeled was not, was not uh, the focus after he kneeled, right? So his message was actually diluted, and that is why I'm saying that he was the only person who benefited from it because he got the Nike contract, all right? Okay, and my other question is, if kneeling is not a legitimate protest, what other forms of protest do you think that the men who play football should do if they is on Carla Kaepernick's side and they're on the field? Like, what other form of protest do you think that the football players should take? So, the football players, if they're on the field, specific, specifically the football players? Yes. Stay inside. Hello. Hello. My name is Adia Gully and I'm a senior at Booker T. Washington High School. And my question is, how do you just tell them to stay inside when this is our, their way for black people and everyone to come together if it's supposed to be liberty and justice for all when there's no liberty and justice for all? They're asking that you they're asking that you directly repeat your question. Okay. My question is, how could you tell Kaepernick to just stay inside when in the pledge we say liberty and justice for all when there is no liberty and justice for all? That's our way of coming together when kneeling, not disrespecting the flag. That's Instead of marching or, um, I guess, protesting in a negative way, that's a positive way for even young, younger children can participate or elders, you know, anybody else can do it. So how would you just tell him to stay inside? Like, I don't understand. Before I answer that question, can I ask you a question? Of course you can. Uh, <laughs> if you're going to participate in a protest, right? Mm -hmm. Would you want to see a result? Absolutely. Okay, and that is the problem. Because kneeling doesn't come with a result, okay. right? And the form of protest during the Martin Luther King days, during Reverend Lord days, right? We have mm -hmm. seen where results have been oriented. And not only that, we see persons like Lebron, Lebron James and others who are, protest, who are protesting against the same thing. And their method is different and their method reach the majority and their, met and their method comes with solution. For example, uh, Lebron would tweet, no, no Lebron, no justice, which was a Twitter, no, no justice, no Lebron, which was a Twitter campaign. And we saw all that uh, boom Twitter. We saw persons retweeting and all of that. We saw when he actually went to the park and keep a concert and all different races came together with an, with a, with an understanding of what is taking place. And what I'm saying is that your, the message that he's sending is being diluted, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, we understand and yes, we sympathize that black people are being oppressed. But at the end of the day, it doesn't make sense for us to take part in anything. Because I'm sure Reverend uh, Laurie did not march the mere fact that he just wanted to exercise. He marched because he believed that that march would come with some change. Same for Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks did not sat on that bus because she was so lazy to get up. She sat on that bus because she wanted change and that change came. 
uh, we saw black people and white people could sit anywhere on the bus and that is what we are simply saying that kneeling is not solution oriented all it is chip up your knee when you kneel all right kneeling no mm -mm. kneeling is a mechanism that we've come up with to defend our people so you know history will repeat itself if we don't do anything to try to make that change thank you Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Muhammad Ba, and I attend the Best Academy. Um, so my question was, so particularly if one kneels before a person who is standing or sitting, the kneeling position renders a person defenseless and unable to flee. So what are your other methods of legitimate protesting? Because many believe that asking a black man to get on his knees is an act of submission. Well said, my, my brother. <laughs> Colin is a popular and well-known and well-known football player. Where technology is, is going today is really simple, and I believe that a, a press conference, something like this that we're doing now, would be appropriate because you're reaching out to people, right? You're not dividing people. So just just as I mentioned earlier. Just like LeBron, you can go on Twitter, you can have debates, you can have discussion, you can have public forums. There are so many things that you can do to engage for people to hear. You can have meaningful conversation. Because the problem is that when you kneel, when he, when he kneeled, his message was actually diluted. And we're saying that there are other means, so public forums, discussion, social media, and all of that. These are ways and means in the 21st century that, that can be used. And they are solution-oriented. So um, you said that in some contexts, right, kneeling is considered as a, a black man submitting to something, anything, right? Yeah. All right. The thing is, you know, even though in some contexts that is considered as the case, it is not considered as the case when you kneel in front of the flag. So it's not necessarily saying that you're submitting to some system or something else. A lot of people take it as, as being disrespectful, as, as not showing reverence and respect to all the sacrifices that have been made in the United States, and so forth and so on. And that's the issue that we have with kneeling. Not necessarily that it cannot represent, uh, represent the idea of submitting, but that, that it can also represent other ideas. And because of the plurality of this, this complex idea, that's the issue. There are so many conversations going around whether or not the black man probably submitted whether or not he was disrespectful whether or not he has no part he has no role or he has no right to kneel in front of the flag whether or not Donald Trump what he tweeted was right because of the multiplicity of this situation because of the the, con the, the conversations that are being had around the idea in and of itself and not necessarily that he did this because he wanted to protest against black lives that's the issue because we see that what happened is that the the the, the, the the, the, the exaggeration is being placed on that. The conversations are being surrounded by that. And as a result of that, the government, it doesn't really feel the obligation to do something about that because people are, 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 are uh, basically, people are, people are attacking something that they have the responsibility to, to protect, which is the symbolic, symbolic, uh, symb symbolic uh, sus. <laughs> sorry, I have stutters sometimes, which is the symbolism of the, United, the flag of the United States in and of itself. And we just do not want the message to be like, diluted. What we are saying is that we want to promote an explicit stance say this is what we're doing attack the systems directly stop productivity tell the government that we want this from you and we expect that you are going to do something we don't want to create an environment where individuals can create any type of situation and create any type of mayhem from the action itself because we want to produce solutions so that's what we're saying uh, thank you um, I'm Demetrius Jackson from South Atlanta I'm a senior, and my question is to Team J. You say to have a better um, protest besides kneeling, but in Charlottesville, um, Virginia, there was a riot with neo-Nazis and white supremacists against the Black Lives Matter movement. What other form of protest should we take if that only brings violence? It was a violent protest between neo-Nazis and white supremacists in the Black Lives Matter movement. Could you directly repeat your question, please? 
you say to have a better protest besides kneeling. But in Charlottesville, Virginia, there was a riot between neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and the Black Lives Matter movement. What other form of protest should we take and they're, if they're only going to bring violence? So what other forms of non-violent protest that we can take instead of kneeling, right? Uh, we've mentioned several different op uh, options. Uh, keep uh, press conferences, a march for Black Lives uh, Matter, uh, go a a a on a Twitter campaign, tell them that you're not going to show up if it is that they do not see some type of results or even some type of conversations. We are saying that what we want to see is that we say boycott uh, certain white businesses if it is necessary. Do something that affects the system in and of itself. That's what we're saying. We're not saying create or go into a space now where there it can be so many different conversations. We're saying do something that explicitly states that you're trying to represent for this idea, that you're trying to get results for this particular idea so that they have no other option than to respond to the direct questions and the direct actions that you're taking. So that's what we're saying. And I have another question for my black brother right there. You said Rosa Parks sat down on the bus and they changed history. What's the difference between sitting down and kneeling? Thank you for that. Good question. What's the difference? Because now what we see is that you and a white man can ride on a bus. But what we're seeing when, when, when Colin Neal is, is a different conversation. We're not, the, 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 the police brutality that is affecting the black man is being thrown aside. So we, now, we're having other, now we're having other discussions, right? So the system was not directly attacked when he kneeled. And that's the difference. When Rosa sat on that bus, the system was directly attacked. And so white people and so white people and black people know right together on a bus. When Colin Neal, the system was not directly attacked, right? And that is the difference because now we're not having a conversation. The conversation that surrounds kneeling now is not about Black Lives Matter. It is about military people. It is about the flag. It is about this and that. So the message was diluted because it did not directly attack the system. And that is the difference, the solution versus the garbage. That is being said now. Thank you. Good day. I'm Lauren Jones from Coretta Scott King Young Women's Leadership Academy. I'm a junior. Um, all forms of protest, whether initiated by the politically aligning left or the right, receive some form of backlash. Does this backlash invalidate the meaning of protests? Yes. Yeah, no, no, backlash does not invalidate the meaning of protest. All right, so the thing is, you know, if, if it is that you attack the system directly, you are attacking individuals, you're attacking their characters, you're attacking their responsibilities, you're attacking their roles directly, right? But the thing is, you have a right to this, right? But, but, but you have a right to all forms of protest. But what we see happening now in a space that they're conflicting emotions, that they're creating some type of, of, of irrationality, that they're creating some type of unnecessary anger and radical emotions, like radical emotions, forcing people to even hold closer to them the ideas that black people probably don't even belong in the country, the ideas that black people are disrespectful, the, any type of stereotypes that they have. We are giving the, them the opportunity to say that, listen, they're attacking something directly that has so much meaning for us, and we're creating this radical space of emotions, and that's not what we don't want. What we want to see is a space where individuals are not necessarily saying that they're attacking who we are you know or what it is that this country is found upon but we're saying that we're attacking the systems within which uh, exist uh, that, that exist within the country and we need to fix this problem and not the country in and of itself you understand yes, yes but <laughs> why would someone who has such an irrational way of thinking try to reason rationally with a protest that they do not agree with in the slightest they know have a greater obligation um, in this sense because there are certain international principles that that govern the idea of civil unrest right mm -hmm. the idea of holding the government accountable of providing an ultimatum to the government so what happens is that no this problem is not just national this problem is international and people are looking on and the government has a responsibility especially in a space where it's supposed to protect human rights to act on this responsibility and that's what we're saying all right 
Thank you. Hello, my name is Carla Franklin. I go to South Atlanta High School. And my question is, you say that kneeling is a limited, legitimate form of a protest against reality, reality, police reality. Is it because of kneeling itself or because when the person kneeled, it was doing a national anthem? So our side is saying that kneeling in itself is legitimate but it also leads to legitimate forms of action to stop the very things that they're protesting in the first place. You may not see it directly from um, leaning itself, just like with Martin Luther King. He did not do it himself. He brought others around him to fight in the civil rights movement. If it was just Martin Luther King himself, you would not see this change you see today. That's what we are saying with kneeling. We're not saying that kneeling brings no change, right? Because it does. You can't say it's not a big part of today's society. As you see Colin Kaepernick being represented in the Time Magazine and a bunch of news articles bringing awareness to millions of people around the world. We do say that it is part of this integral change in order to change people's mind to make legitimate change into today's society when it comes to legislation, when it comes to uh, putting the right people in the positions of power. Also, it's a situation in which we're pointing out a lot of the hypocrisy that surrounds how black speech is regulated in other environments, right? On their side of the house, they would have you believe that any like, form of protest that causes individuals to be uncomfortable, which is the point of a protest, is somehow illegitimate. And then they try and say that, well, if it doesn't manifest in on governmental officials. But we're also seeing a situation where we're pointing out the hypocrisy and viewpoints. People say this is disrespecting veterans when Colin consulted a veteran. And, you know, even if you want to go a little further back to Tim Tebow, he would take a knee before the game, and he would take a knee on the football field, and all of a sudden he was, you know, revered for being, you know, the best, you know, American red-blooded male that Christian white America had to offer, but when Colin Kaepernick does it, you know, all of a sudden he's an unpatriotic exile who, you know, needs to be mitigated or addressed or gotten rid of in some sort of way. Thank you. Wow. Okay, my name is Jemiah Moore, and I'm a senior at Coretta Scott King, and I don't have a question. This is more of a general comment, but I just feel like, um, you, if, you, if you feel like there's no justice being served in our country, Uh, my name is Sean Feliciano. I am an 11th grader at DM Thero High School, born and raised. <laughs> and <laughs> this is uh, a statement directed at Morehouse College, and it's this. Kneeling, I believe that kneeling at its base core is just a form of submission. Um, wars that are fought, nope, when a king, when the army kneels to someone, that is literally them saying, I adhere to what you are, I adhere to everything that you represent, and I will follow you. That is submission. And you gave examples of football players kneeling on the field to the American flag. Of course they will, of course they will kneel, no matter what color they are, because they're football players. The American flag has helped them. They're rich, they're famous. They don't have to worry about anything. On the other hand, on the other hand, Kids like us, uh, we, we, ain't, we, ain't got them, we ain't got them kind of opportunities, at least not right now. So that's just a statement that I'm directing at you all. And if you have a retort to that, I would love to hear it. But I think that protest evokes change. And change is, change is something that not everybody is comfortable with. Kneeling is literally saying, I will do what you say whenever you say it. And that's all there is to it. Good night. Uh, so just to, just to address that real quick, uh, he, he made his exit, God bless. But in terms of kneeling as a form of protest, right, we understand that um, what's expected of us as Americans, whether or not we're included in that tapestry or framework in itself, we're expected to stand. Standing is the measure of respect that individuals are expected to offer the flag and the national anthem. And so by kneeling, you're taking a stance and saying that in a country where even as a football player, even when I do have personal material wealth, 
if I go out and I'm not recognized, then I can still get shot. I can still get beat. We saw this with a uh, Milwaukee, Milwaukee Bucks player. He was coming out of a shopping store. Um, he, he had bought himself some, some items. And what happened? He was accused of stealing. And even though this guy is presumably 6'8 or above, the police beat the heck out of him because of the color of his skin. And so even material wealth or having a seat at the table in the smallest regard won't afford you safety in a country that was never intended for you to be counted as a full idea of a human man. And that's why we kneel, because it's the direct opposite, the direct contradiction of standing to show reverence, because we have no respect for a flag that doesn't respect us. When it, when it comes to kneeling, it means different things for different people. You may see it as whatever you want, but you, some other person might actually think uh, might view their kneeling as something different from you. So whether or not you agree with the way they protest, you have to congratulate and, and actually celebrate that they have the courage to protest in the, uh, at all. Because as you see, Colin Kaepernick was exiled from the NFL. He was not re-signed to the uh, 49ers, my hometown, San Francisco, thank you. But, um, but he was not re-signed because of the things that he did. He knew the risk of uh, doing what he did and he still do it but so you have to celebrate that right because change cannot come without information and change cannot come without disruption people people are comfortable in the way things are they're still gonna be doing the things if you're comfortable in bed right you're still gonna stay in bed un un until the cold it becomes cold you're gonna turn the, uh, you're gonna get up and actually turn the AC to warm right so this is the same thing people are being comfortable you have to change uh, people's minds by disrupting their thing, right? So that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, APS students, for your questions and comments. We'll now extend the opportunity for both teams to offer closing arguments. Morehouse, I invite you to the podium for your one minute closing. First of all, I'm so glad that we've been able to have this debate and have this conflict of thought to really talk about a salient issue in today's society. But in terms of today's debate, you're going to see two different worlds, right? You're going to see the world that opposition gives you in which any time a protest makes individuals uncomfortable, any time a protest uh, seems to you know, call things into conflict or seems to alienate other individuals, then somehow that protest isn't valid. And we understand that that definition goes contrary to literally everything that a protest is designed to do. And we also have to understand that as black men and women in today's society, as people of, of color at large, we have no other recourse. Nothing can afford us true safety in today's America because at the highest levels of power, even if we have a seat at the table, it's still controlled by individuals who don't look like us and don't have our best interests in mind. So so no matter how much personal wealth we amass, no matter how much social media influence or clout that we might have, we can still get a bullet to the back at any point in time. If we want to bring a football analogy into this, a black person in America today can die on any given Sunday. And because of the fact that we have no other recourse for that, we must protest. It is our obligation, it is our duty, and it is our survival. Thank you. Thank you, Morehouse. Jade, I invite you to the podium for your one minute closing. Hi again. We're not arguing that we're trying to protect emotions. We're saying that we're trying to stop the spread of the idea of radical emotions. We're saying that that gets too much attention in the media. We're saying that it gets people in a web of anger and not the people who should be placed in a web of anger, which is the government, which is the system. We are saying that we're trying to say that we want to promote another form of protest because kneeling does nothing. What we are saying is that silence does not force change. And an action void of the message, it, it does not do anything. 
only thing that does do that is speaking up and speaking out. Something that disrupts, uh, disrupts productivity. Something that actively seeks advocacy. It is promoting the di di diversity of freedom of press. It is holding town hall meetings. It is forcing the government to appreciate the social contracts. It is restoring the Martin Luther King days where hundreds take to the streets, where people are not silenced by kneeling, where the existence of social divide is explicitly stated, where the people legitimately challenge the government to take the actions and hold them to their words. It is forcing the government in spaces that they cannot ignore the happenings and cannot find a legitimate counter. It involves the participation of hundreds acting in a unified voice where the government cannot possibly have the strength to silence so many. We are saying that if we want to protect black people, if we want to stop the, the idea of them dying by the numbers daily, we need to seek active methods of protest. Thank you. Thank you, Jade. Thank you, Morehouse. Let's give both teams a round of applause. And now we'll have a special presentation from our principal, Shelley Powell, and seniors, Davia Williams and Jacob Lockhart. What a debate. Let's give both of our teams a great round of applause, everyone. Good morning. My name is Shelley Powell, principal of the illustrious, illustrious Daniel McLaughlin Thero High School. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today and allowing us to be your host at the Reverend Joseph E. Lowry series on civic engagement. Atlanta Public Schools has hosted this event for 16 years and every single year it becomes better and better. And it is truly an honor to have members of the Lowry family with here with us today, as well as the Morehouse College Speech and Debate Team and the Jamaican Association for Debating and Empowerment Limited. And so before we close, we would like to take a moment to gift the Lowry family and both debate teams with a commemorative poster of today's lecture series. David and Jacob, please join me. Would representatives from the Lowry family and Lowry Institute please come to the stage? <laughs> to the members of the Lowry family and the Joseph and Evelyn Lowry Institute, Please accept this expression of our respect and gratitude. We present you with this gift, not only for your participation in this event, but more importantly, for the countless contributions you have made and continue to make toward improving our society. Would the debate team please come forward? <laughs> to the debate team from the Jamaican Association for the Bain and Empowerment Limited and the Morehouse Speech and Debate Team, we thank you too for your participation here today. Your display of intellect, scholastic flexibility, and oratory skills were truly impressive and an inspiration to student attendees and all who witnessed this event here today. Thank you. My name is Amina Johnson. My name is Marcus Berg, and we're both seniors at Thero High School. <laughs> 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 
On behalf of the students and staff of Atlanta Public Schools, we thank you all for coming and taking part in this special event. No matter what side of the issue you took at the beginning or at the end of the debate, I think we can all agree that both sides presented thoughtful, concise arguments that will give us all something to think about as we move forward. As we depart from here and go back to our individual schools, I would like to, I would like to leave everyone with words of wisdom from Reverend Lowry. We have come too far, marched too long, wept too bitterly, and suffered too much brutality to turn back now. And with those words, we conclude the 16th edition of the Reverend Joseph E. Lowry Lecture Series. Thank you again for coming. Students, please remain seated and listen for instruction on boarding your buses to return back to your schools. Thank you.